All right. So we kind of got into it. Let's get into it. You want to start at this? Yeah. So I can introduce you. Yeah. People are like, okay, so what is this? All right. So um, Bennett here. Well, I call him Bennett. Ke- Kevin. <laughs> Does sure. anybody else call him Bennett besides me? Oh, yeah. No. Uh, oh, cool. It's, okay. It's probably half and half. Oh, nice. All right. Because I was like, I just love the word Bennett because it reminds me of Commando. I don't know why. Bennett. But um, so anyway, uh, Bennett here was gracious enough to interview me. I forget what the reason was behind it, but it was really great, fun interview. And then recently had me in your group to share some health information. And uh, and that was an honor and really enjoyed that. And after a couple of discussions, you know, we were both like, hey, I need I need to interview you and have a conversation with you because I feel like um, you're just you're right along the lines of what it is that we're trying to accomplish, just doing it in a different way, which is this whole kind of self-reliance thing um so as we have this discussion as always there's there's an intention my intention here is to have a conversation and pull some positive learnings from it and um and bennett here is the founder creative exit group and and it's a place correct me if i'm wrong uh it's kind of dedicated to self-reliance and exiting the mainstream narrative for lack of a better way of saying it um uh ending your reliance on corporate employment and um, trying to be more self-reliant and maybe just live a better, more fulfilling life and trying to figure out what those things are. And then you help facilitate, you know, people moving in that direction. And whether it's, you know, you offer an advice, um, I mean, I guess we can get into how you actually do that with the hot seats and bringing in other mentors and coaches and things like that. But does that sound about right? Yeah, so it, uh, I would say fundamentally, it's about sovereignty. It's 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 a men's group uh, built around achieving sovereignty because basically it, it, we're acknowledging that that um, we're in a hostile political situation. We're no longer uh, there's well, it's it's based on um, a, a theory from political science actually that 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 you've got the option to exercise voice in a system. Or I guess it's sociology, the option to exercise voice in a system or to exercise exit. So voice is voting, you know, uh, having a conversation with your spouse, um, complaints to customer service, um, being being part of a, of a leadership decision, any anything where you are an active participant in the way that the group makes decisions. And when that system breaks down, what's left is exit. Um, so that's the way that you the way that you change how the institution affects you is by withdrawing from it. And that can either mean a permanent withdrawal, or it can mean like like a labor strike where you are temporarily withdrawing your support in order to increase your leverage for a negotiation so you can get into a better situation. But also, I was going to say that could also mean partial withdrawal. So basically, you're a part of a system that you feel like you can be vocal and express your opinions and uh, you know the rights to free speech and things like that. And then if you feel like that's being threatened in some way, exiting could be complete exit. It could be exit in the areas that you feel like are most important to you or have the most impact or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, so if you, um, if you, for example, are the CEO of a major corporation and, and, and something's gone wrong, um, the way for you to have maximum impact probably is not to, to pull the ripcord and, and bail. There's probably things you can do internally, but if you're like a project manager at Amazon, the idea you're going to like fuck the system and like your your voice is going to count for a ton and the way that that corporate culture unfolds is that's a little silly. And so um now now you can make a difference if you organize and you build alternatives for yourself and you 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 connect with a community. So I mean that's that's the essence of what a labor union is, right? That's we're going to get together so that we have power. And uh and so that our withdrawal inflicts enough pain on the institution that we uh, can have leverage in a negotiation. And so, uh, yeah, what we're trying to do is, is get a group of guys who have the ability to push back and uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be millions. Uh, It can be enough guys to have a conversation like, like a, a big part of the problem in, in politics right now is that it the conversation is dominated by people 
with, with kind of no skin in the game, no, no investment in the future. And so guys who have, you know, mouths to feed and, and, and responsibilities, uh, their tendency is to keep their heads down and their mouth shut. But like, those are the sanest people. Those are the people that you need to have in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's about strengthening those people so they can contribute. Yeah. And when you say, I mean, the vibe I get is not even, it's not even so much about pushing back as it is giving these people, these guys an option to, to be on their own self-reliant and not have to be a part of something that they don't resonate with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's both. I mean, the, 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 the there's, there's different. Sounds uh, like you're trying to build a rebellion. Well, you know, I, what's important about it. I mean, I mean, what I think makes it different is that we are trying to push back in ways that create the minimum uh, immune response from the system. So nobody's ever talking about anything illegal. Nobody's talking about guns. Nobody's talking about flags or, 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 or chain. Like it's, it's nothing to do with that. It's about entrepreneurship and food storage and self-sufficiency stuff that stuff that, uh, there's no, um, nobody's worried about that. Nobody's worried about you if you're doing that. Like it's, those are all positive, positive ways to build capacity, to build strength. But ultimately, yes, the, the, the goal is to reclaim some, some power in the conversation and change that conversation. Yeah. And by doing what you're doing though, you're also, it's like you and, and the people that, you know, you support, you're joining a grassroots movement which is has the same intention, right? It's like you're speaking with your purchasing dollars. You're speaking with the way that you eat. You're speaking, you know, with the people that you surround yourself with, with your ability to speak up for the things that you believe in. And so we're all part of this. Like you said, it's the minimal effective dose or something like that, right? It's this fringe, but it's also, it can't be ignored and it's getting larger and larger. And this in some ways is, you know, maybe how we kind of take back our country and our freedoms and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, from a practical perspective, that's, 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 we do networking, we do meetups, we, we help people find, um, so there's networking in the sense of like getting to know a big group of guys. There's also one-on-one -on -one networking in terms of like, oh, you need a digital marketer for your business. You need a, uh, you need a copywriter. You need, um, you need to talk to a lawyer about, you know, some, some general questions. Uh, those are the kinds of one-on-one -on -one connections that we're, that we're making. And, and basically, Fairly early on, we had almost every like major professional skill set represented. And if we didn't have the guy, we knew who knew the guy. So so um, it actually doesn't take a huge group to be really, really powerful. Yeah. And, Sounds like uh, the definition of a community almost like, you know, you come together, everybody has their different skills and their strengths to support the greater good. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and because <clears throat> it's oriented around a goal. It's not like, you know, there, there have been prior attempts at like, you know, uh, uh, uniting people around politics. Mm -hmm. And basically what where I think that has failed is like, first of all, everybody's got their personal like political philosophy. And if there's disagreement, then it's like, well, what are we even doing here if we don't agree? And and um, it's almost anti what you're doing. Sounds like, I mean. Yeah, we, we don't yeah. we don't really talk about like we're we're about we're about action. We're about uh making your life better, making your family's life better. And ultimately the 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 goal is to build a society in which we can all have grandkids. Um I love it. Because the the, the problem with, you know, quote unquote cancel culture is not necessarily that like there's consequences for saying, you know, spicy things like that's best part of being an adult. You, there, there are consequences for the things that you say. That's just life. But the problem is basically that the people who are in charge of like deciding who gets in trouble for saying things, they have just like this complete inversion of the value system. They, they, like it's, 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 it's the craziest. It's the worst people who are in charge of, of, of that stuff. And so what we are pushing back against is not like there should be no consequences for anybody's speech. What we're saying is like, there's, there's particular conversations that need to happen uh, specifically and particularly around our families 
and and how men and women relate to each other and and those conversations can't happen within this current structure with the current power dynamics so we have to change power dynamics we have to get stronger so that we can speak up so that we can build families so that our kids can get together and have babies and 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 it's i mean it, ultimately it's about civilization it's about does this thing continue or not i love it i love it so i want to get into that like some of your thoughts about you know um how we got to where we are, but would you mind just sharing, like, how did you get to where you are? <laughs> what, you know, what brought you to, to doing what you're doing right now? You have a really interesting story. Uh, yeah. So um, I was, a, I was a data scientist, a econ major, very like bog standard corporate data guy. Um, Me too. I was an economics I, major and d- I had the worst finances for the most majority of my life. <laughs> Didn't learn a whole lot. <laughs> Keynesian economics, yeah. macro, micro, you know, it's actually what's wrong with economics these days. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, what what was valuable about mine was basically that it was like a proto data science major. Like it, I learned how to do regression analysis, which meant that I could go learn Python and go get a data science job. So yeah, my undergrad was useless more or less. But um, but I I was uh, really bored and 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 felt really uh uh out of place in my job and goofed around on Twitter a lot and I actually built uh, you know a little bit of a following on Twitter and then um there was a there was an antifa communist uh anti-mormon ex-mormon group that uh actually infiltrated um one of our group chats, it was, you know, a group of friends that, you know, were, were sort of conservative Latter-day Saints and, um, you know, figured out who we all were and, and wrote these exposés of us one week after the other for about a month and a half. And, um, they were, you know, I was everything in the book. I was racist, homophobic, misogynistic, just all the, all the words. And, um, now who was it that was doing this? As an Antifa group, uh, anti-fascist, uh, communist thing. Um, anti-fascist means means communist. That just to be clear. Um, I was yeah. That's almost a, like, um, it's almost a misnomer, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, All right. Yeah. Uh, it that, sounds like if, if they were, they wouldn't be coming after you guys. But okay, so they they figured out, hey, these guys are spreading a message that we don't really agree with, or something like that, and so they started. Right. To, I mean, to be clear, yeah. to be clear, I was saying I was saying things about uh, the traditional relationship between men and women. I was saying things about gay marriage. I was saying things about uh, they didn't like that I reviewed Charles Murray's book Human Diversity, which talks about uh, uh, genetic differences in IQ. Um, they didn't like that. I talked about Epstein. I said that was anti-Semitic, which, you know, whatever. Um, I feel like you can talk about Epstein. And, um, so anyway, they, they, uh, I, I got, I got, uh, hauled into HR and they made me read some of my tweets, my, my greatest hits. And I, I you're like, I, uh, you're like kind of laughing as you're reading. I'm like, Oh yeah, that was really good. Or no, no, I was, I, 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 actually, <laughs> I actually did. Uh, I, I couldn't help it. Um, for, for a couple of them, they were some good tweets. It, it reminds me of uh, not to get on too much of a tangent. Same thing happened to me at the military academy. I I didn't know I didn't know they were reading. You know, it was an internal system. You know, all, all our emails, and I got brought in the office one day, and she was reading these to me. I was like, "Oh man, I can't believe you guys read that." But that was actually really good. So go ahead. <laughs> well, anyway, um, yeah. So so um, they actually gave me a couple of weeks of notice. The um, the Antifa guys, because I guess they wanted to make me sweat. Um, they kind of reached out to me and said, Hey, this is, this is coming down. Oh, so and, this was uh, in, within your company. These are people within your no, company. No, oh, no, they so were, they... They, well, it, it sort of, well, it's, that's complicated. Okay. Um, all right. Sorry. But, uh, see, I'm paying attention. Just trying to make sure I understand it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was, it was people from the internet, um, who were mad that I was Latter-day Saint and that I was conservative and they contacted HR and um, um they first contacted me then they contacted hr and um i i you know let people know what was happening I and mean, i didn't really need to people knew and um got this huge outpouring of support people saying you know like this really sucks what happened to you let me know if i can connect you with anything connect you with a job you know what do you need and um 
for most of them, my answer was nothing. Like I, there's nothing, there's nothing you can personally do for me. Um, and I actually had, I had the same experience because like I said, I was, I was one of maybe a dozen who got rolled up in this way. And I, you know, one of them was a lawyer. One of them was another like data guy. And I, and, and I was like, you know, I don't have anything to give this guy, but I wish I did. And what occurred to me was if I got all of the people who were uh, expressing their desire to help, if I got all those people into one room and I said, what if instead of helping the guy or trying to help the guy in the immediate crisis, the one time, what if we tried to strengthen ourselves so that this kind of thing wouldn't even be a problem in the future? Like, uh, you know, I was, I was fortunate in that I had an audience and, you know, I had, I had a, a big group of people who knew about what was going on with me and, and could, you know, give me that kind of support. Um, a lot of guys don't. And so they really like, there's not, a, there's not like an upside for them. If this happens to them, for me, I was able to kind of ride the wave and build something with it. And, and, hmm. and that's, uh, that's a privilege. And I wanted to, I didn't want to just take that and, you know, grab one of those opportunities and just go get a job. I wanted to turn it into something that would be bigger and more meaningful. And so I, uh, I got some of those guys together. I said, you know, Hey, if we start this, this fraternal organization and, and, uh, you know, I'll facilitate it, we'll have, we'll have member dues and we'll support each other when we get into trouble. And that, that was the genesis of the hot seat, which you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. where, you know, if somebody does actually get into a doxing situation or they're getting fired over a vax mandate or whatever, then we circle the wagons. We do a, we do a hot seat. We get everybody in the room and we try to address uh, their challenge and, and, and find resources for them as a group. Um, so can I stop this, you real quick? I just want to make sure I understand something. Sure. Um, so uh, as you're going through this situation where you had the, the anti- would you say that anti moth Antifa? Antifa, anti Antifa. Um, and, and there's like this, uh, some threatening, uh, a threatening situation. Who was it that came and offered you or asked you, hey, what is it that I can do for you? Or what is it that you need? Who was it that said that? Oh, dozens of people. Like lots Okay, of just people in general. Okay. And you're like, I'm good. But you realize this is probably something that would benefit other people, or I may not need it right now, but at some point in the future. So I'm going to form this well, group, or we're going to form a group so that we can support each other in the event that, you know. It wasn't something. necessarily that I was squared away, because I, I wasn't. I didn't have yeah. a job lined up. It was more that, like, most of those people didn't have a job that I could take. Yeah. Um. I, but maybe, maybe three or four of them did. But I just, I, I wanted to, I wanted to take that whole reservoir of goodwill and make productive use of the whole thing. Yeah. And I and this is happening while you're still employed, right? Or, or at this point, when you formed the group, did you? I mean, I had been sent home. Okay. Uh, I wasn't fired yet. I, the, 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 the idea came to me the morning I uh, got sent home. And I, I happened to be uh, sitting on some cash because of the way that we moved out here. I, I, I had taken a brand new job, by the way. I was, I, I, I got fired after like a week of work. Um, so, so because of the because of the way that our relo had gone down, I had I had a little bit of reserves, and I basically thought, you know, if I can't make this work in a year, I probably can't make it work. So. You know, there's not going to be a better opportunity. And I, and I, I you know, I, I think, uh, I think God was in that. Um, I think it's just a lot of things were lined up just, just precisely perfect. And um, so anyway, uh, yeah, we started it with, I think we had, I think we had like 60 or 70 guys in the first two weeks. Like it was, it was a big rush and um lots of people wanted to be involved and it started with like one weekly call. And the subject of that weekly call was what do you guys want this thing to be? Hmm. <laughs> and, uh, cause I, you know, I didn't have like a, I didn't have it all figured out what I wanted. I was going to gonna say like, and what was that like? What was it like? Was it exciting or was it like stressful or what? Oh, it was, I, I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I, you know, you're like, you know, um, I got this thing and I'm like, how do I, do, what do we do? <laughs> you know, it's the distance between 
what it could be, which is something just so incredible, so mm-hmm. cool and failure. Like, like the, you know, if you're in a regular job, like, and like a great year is like a promotion and a bonus and like a real bad year is like you get put on a performance improvement plan or something like the distance between that. There's just not this tension, this pull. Yeah. You're but still the, making your base salary. Right. But, but like the, the distance between, um, you know, could we, could we, could we change the country? Could we change the world versus, you know, could I just completely crash and burn and humiliate myself? Yeah. Uh, that, that gulf created a ton of pressure and tension. Well, and it was I mean, a, yeah, if you're saying, can we change the country, but even just like, you know, aspirationally, can I make something good and positive out of this or is it just going to crash and burn? Um, yeah. I commend you. I mean, you know, I, I feel like that's, you know, more people just need to take those kind of chances or risks or whatever, whatever you want to call it. You know, it's like, I, yes. I feel like that's what life is about. I've learned. And it sounds like that's where you're at. You know, like you, you come up against these things and there's this huge unknown, but it's like, why not? I got to go for it. You know, especially if your heart and there's good intention behind it and you're, you're trying to provide a service for other people. So that's awesome. I, I love that. No, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody <clears throat> say to me, I wish they'd fire me. Like, I wish... I wish they'd kick me out of, of the nest and make it, you know, like, well, getting, getting fired is one thing, getting fired the way I got fired where like I'm Googleable and it's a problem. Like I, you know, I wasn't going back. There was no going back. Um, so, you know, g- getting your ships burned for you, uh, can, can be a really powerful thing. And I, like, I, yeah, I don't, I don't say this, I don't say this to be sarcastic or to like, or to like, this is hundred percent sincere. I am grateful that that happened. I'm grateful that they did that. And, and I don't, I'm not mad at them. I'm a little scared of them because like they posted my address, they posted pictures of my family. They like that, that part was like scary, Wow. but it's the best thing that ever happened to me uh, apart from my family. I like, love it. I love it. Yeah. That, that's a message we talk about all the time. You know, like, um, you know, wherever you're at right now is, is this compilation of, you know, things that, you know, looking back or in the moment may even seem like they were, you know, maybe not great decisions and could have a, a, a bad outcome, but it's like, look at the impact that you're having now. I think that's such a beautiful story, you know? Thanks, man. Well, um, so we did talk about a bunch of other things the other day, but uh, we're 30 minutes into this. What about, um, what would be, you know, based on everything that you know, and that you're passionate about that you're working on and that you're helping other people with, what are some things that you wish other people knew? Like, do we have some like little lessons or learning points that we could share? Um, you know, but the other day when we talked about, it, I think we called them life lessons, but I mean, like just what comes to mind is like, you know, what's the most important thing for someone listening to this, never heard of you, you know, um, what is the most important thing or things to consider or be aware of? Uh, don't look at averages. Don't, um, you know, if, if you, what the average business fails, right? Uh, there's a George Carlin joke. Think about how dumb the average person is and then realize that half of them are dumber than that. Like, like. Take it some notes. Hold on. You, you don't have to be average. And, and the fact that most businesses fail has nothing to do with your potential. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I took a safe major, I took a safe job because I thought I was being responsible. I thought I was being a grown up and sort of accepting my lot in life. And, uh, and that was a huge mistake. Um, you know, six, six years of my life. And, you know, during those six years, I had lots of good things in my life. We got a house, we got, I got beautiful kids, beautiful wife. Um, so like, you know, you can have a good life under those circumstances, but man, if, if all you've ever known is this W2, like flesh pots of Egypt, like people who despise you handing you your little crumb for your effort. And there's no, there's no connection to like reality or output. There's no connection to like the difference you're making in the world. You like, you just, you just can't imagine how different it feels. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and the other thing about it is 
maybe I'm, maybe I'm making this case, like it all has to be this world changing thing, but like, I'm, I'm really not. You can, you can make money for yourself in like an hour after work. You can, you can just the feeling of money coming in that is not from your like overlord is uh, it's, it, there's a psychological transformation there because then you realize like, oh, my, my time has a value that is not defined by this number, this salary number that I get paid. Um, and it's, it's malleable, it's flexible. I can, I can make more or I can make less depending on how much work I put in and how much output and, and the value of the thing that I'm doing. So like, uh, well, and especially I, if you enjoy it, you know, that's an added bonus. Cause now you're doing something that you're passionate about, enjoy, you know, and you're getting compensated for it, you know? Right. You try, you try, uh, driving for Uber, you try, maybe you even try like mowing lawns and you try selling things on Amazon. And, and one of those things turns out to be enjoyable and lucrative. You flip uh, one of one of my favorite ones to throw at guys who are like mechanically minded is go look on Craigslist for a busted lawnmower, a riding lawnmower. You can get those for like 50 bucks and flip it for like 700. Um, and it's usually some little $25 part that they just don't feel like fixing. And it's just, you know, try a bunch of different things, especially if you hate where you are, like you just, you cannot accept that. You can't yeah. accept hating what you do for a living. Well, um, let's, let's, if we could just back up real quick though, cause you said, sure. um, you know, that you were in this, uh, you know, this corporate job and there's a sense of security, but you know, you kind of woke up at some point and I feel like most people that's kind of what we're raised to do, right? We're raised to think about what do you want to be as a kid? You know, how the heck are you supposed to know what you want to be? But anyway, like you grow up thinking right. you're supposed to be something and go to school for something. And um, it's like, if we could teach people like to try to find things they enjoy, like you're saying, experiment, you know, try to find, find doing things that you actually enjoy and can make money at and uh, have this ability to experiment. You know, it's like you, you hear these cliche things when you're younger about you could do anything you want, you could be anything you want, you can chase your dreams and follow your dreams. But then we're not giving, given the formula for that. We're given the formula yeah. for being a freaking, a part of a cog in the wheel. And, and so what you're saying is, you know, you don't have to be that way. Like if you have this, uh, this hint of like, I, I don't know that I want to do this for the rest of my life or I'm not happy with where I'm at. It doesn't even have to be an all or nothing. It could be like, I'm I'm just acknowledging that and I'm going to do something to move myself in a direction of being a little bit more happy. <laughs> you know, side yeah, job, just, and, just you know. Taking command of it. Like, I, and, and you know, you, you, you start to view your W-2 boss as like one contract, one revenue stream, yeah. right? In addition to some others. And uh, and then, you know, there's a, there's a principle in, in negotiation called a BATNA which is your best alternative to negotiated agreement. And your BATNA determines how tight someone can squeeze you uh, before you walk away from the negotiation, right? Um, if I've got an offer for $100,000 in my back pocket and boss offers me and I'm, you know, I'm making, let's say I'm making 90 K and the boss offers me 95. Well, then I just walk away. But if I have nothing in my back pocket and he offers me 95, well, I'm going to take the 95 because hmm. my best alternative is nothing. And so, so it's, it's, and, and that, that principle extends to politics. It extends to the food you eat. It extends to, you know, uh, all of the power structures that we're up against. It's about creating a BATNA, creating an alternative, not necessarily so that you have to walk away, but so that you can, which, which totally, I, I tell guys to go on recreational inter interviews to, uh, you know, when they hear from the guy on LinkedIn, the, the recruiter from some other company, even if they, even if they're like fine with their job and, and not trying to get out of it, or they, they're on some kind of like promotion track that they care about, go take the interview and just like a, it it's actually fun. It's 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 it's. I was just thinking, fun. like it, it's it's an event. It sounds like an adventure, you know. It's like you know, why not explore it? And you never know. I'm sure you never know what's going to come out of that. Like, 
Oh yeah. It, on and paper, it, it could look like some interview for some position and some certain income and some responsibilities, but like you end up connecting with the guy or the girl, and it's just like you never know what could come of it. I love but that. I mean, you could you. I mean, there's there's definitely cases I've heard of where it's like, I was just goofing around and I asked for one hundred and seventy five thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and they said, "Ooh, let me think about that," and they gave it to me. <laughs> so like it. It does happen. And and it happens when you are like, when you're loose and you're liberated and you don't care. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I'm not even sure I want this job, but 175, that I do it for that. Yeah. You know, let's see what they say. Yeah. And, there's, and, there's a certain amount of confidence that comes with that. Not, not given, not, not caring, you know, about the outcome so much. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> that's, that's what I'm all about. 100%. I love it. So, so the first learning point was, um, you're not an average or don't think of yourself in averages. Don't look at the averages, you know, cause averages is it's not a good way to look at things. Right. Yeah. And, um, and if, you know, where you're at right now, if you can be really honest with yourself, even if you've committed your life to it, like I, because I have, I have friends and uh, people that I know that's like, well, you know, they, they vested their entire, you know, who they are in this thing that they're doing. You know, like I've got friends that since they were little kids, they knew they wanted to be a dentist. And not that there's anything wrong with dentists, but, you know, they grow up and, they, and they're just committed to this path, even though they're miserable doing it. Right. So if you can be honest with yourself and just acknowledge like, hey, maybe if I'm not completely happy, this is the one life that we have. Consider the possibility that you could do something else in addition to or maybe even at some point completely separate from what you're doing right now. Yeah. And and what I would add to that is, I mean, we we try to use every part of the buffalo, right? Like if you've got a skill set. If you're a dentist and you hate being a dentist, all right, what exactly do you hate about being a dentist? Do you hate the actual, like being in people's mouths? Do you hate the business side of it? Do you hate, like, what is it? And then we say, all right, really good point. What could you build with the skills that you have? Cause there's a whole dentistry is a, like, if there's a whole uh, business ecosystem, around that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to sell dental like medical equipment? Do you like, do you want to manage a a collection of dentists offices? Like, you know, there's, there's all kinds of whatever your temperament is, whatever you're like the type of work you love to do. The ecosystem that you're trained for is big enough that you can find something else. And it's, I mean, you know, a, a dentist is a good example because a lot of those guys have enough disposable income that they could kind of, they could kind of uh, fly low for a minute and while they start something else up. Yeah. So but what you're saying is even within the context, it's not like a jump completely either or jump ship. It's like maybe within whatever it is you're doing, there's certain aspects that you don't like and there's certain things that you really do enjoy. And then maybe you could find a creative way to do the things you enjoy and not do the things you don't enjoy. It just take take command of it. Yeah. And and I mean that that goes the same. I mean, it's it's the same argument that I make about like the political situation. Because people do have this idea that it's like either everything's working perfectly or we have to run off and join the circus. We have to go crazy. We have to like do something reckless. And it's like, no, there's all kinds of of intermediate options and ways you can strengthen yourself, ways you can get into a better situation where you don't have to blow up your whole life metaphorically. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So, so if you're in a situation where you think you're not happy, that may not mean that you need to completely ditch everything that you're doing. It could just be a matter of sitting and, and uh, assessing, you know, your current situation and saying like, what is it that I truly enjoy about what it is I'm doing? Maybe you do come to realization, like there's nothing that I enjoy about what I'm doing, but you know, maybe there are some aspects of it and you could build something around that. Um, having what else? A, having oh, go ahead. Multi- Having a multidisciplinary group of people. To, yeah, to you you'd said that the other day, like something about having people that you can actually kind of brainstorm and workshop with. Is that what you're talking about? Makes a huge difference. I mean, that's you know, that's what I'm doing. Makes yeah. a huge difference. Yeah. So so how do you go about that? Like if you're not um, if you're not a part of something, you're saying like be a part of a community where you can be open, vulnerable, share ideas, or something that's specifically geared toward what you're talking about. Yeah, there's it's it's. Um, there's always a build by question, right? Are you familiar with the concept of builder by? Like well, if, you're a, if you're if you're a startup, 
you got to decide, are we going to build our website or are we going to pay a developer to build our website? Are we going to have in-house legal or are we going to, you know, have a, somebody on retainer or, 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 you know, buy the hour or something? Um, there's always build or buy. And so, and so if it's about building your network, well, the way you buy it is you find a group like what we've got and you sign up. If you want to build it, then I would do, I would create a CRM, a customer relationship management tool, just a spreadsheet. Everybody, you know, down to like acquaintances from college, if your Facebook uh, friends, everybody, you know, all of their skills that you can think of and all of their needs that you can think of. And then look for ways to help those people and connect those people. And uh, so, so what I mean by that is either you can meet their need or you can find the person who can meet their need. Um, even if that need is like, hey, these, these two people should go bowling. They'd have a fun time. Yeah. And you start, you start making calls and catching up and just feeling it out, feeling out uh, what the possibilities are within your network. Everybody's got those possibilities. The limiting factor is do you have the um, do you have the social skill and the social stamina to do that kind of work? To bring right, that to together go. and facilitate it, you know, because it is response. Right. I'm thinking about my community. I'm like, you know, I've always thought about having a um, almost like a directory of services where everybody kind of shared, you know, what their talents are, what they're good at. And, and we could probably um, add to that and say, what is it that you need support in or something like that? So this is kind of confirming something that I've always wanted to do to some degree. But but basically you're saying within your network, within the people you know, you know, make a list of people and see, you know, what talents and strengths you can kind of pull out of that. And there's a possibility of forming some kind of a group or, or network or something. And maybe even finding someone that's a, maybe if you don't feel like being the leader of it, you know, maybe someone in there would be a good leader putting out the idea yeah. to everybody like hey you know would you guys like to form a a little group and community that's focused on this yeah absolutely that's that's it. another way to do the builder buy decision right like do yeah. i do i be the guy or do i find the guy lots yeah. of ways to do it i love it and as we're doing this like i said at the beginning you know we have it's just, I feel like there's people like us that are, I don't know what to call it. You can't, I hate to use the word awake anymore because of the woke deal, but like you have people that are like aware, right? And when I was younger, I, I wouldn't have even considered some of the things I'm thinking about. And I don't know when I started to transition into what would be considered conspiracy theory type stuff, but it's really just the way things are, you know, it's like, you know, um, but a conspiracy it's conspiracy theorist is somebody who remembers what they said six months ago. Like that's, who, who who remembers the narrative six months ago and can compare it to the current narrative. That's yeah. what a conspiracy theorist is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's like, you know, we said in the beginning, it's like um, uh, in our own ways, the people that are uh, kind of awake to what's happening or whatever you want to call that, um, we're, it's like we're, we're doing our part in these little grassroots movements. And this is a way or part of the way or a contribution to the way that we can take back our whatever it is, like freedom, country, you know, this ability, like you say, to be autonomous. And and then you can take that to another level because communities are, are really where it's at, like family connections, communities, right? Maybe consider forming your own little community if you don't already have one and do what you said, like figure out who's got what strengths and um, is there a possibility for us to form something here that's not already uh, defined? Yeah, absolutely. And, and th there's going to be there's going to be tens of thousands of them. I mean, it's, it's, it's because the, the lots of, lots of companies like, like LinkedIn and lots of like job board type companies, they've really tried to automate and scale, uh, essentially human connection. And I, I think we're learning that you, you kind of just can't you, like, so, so it's, there's only so many people that a human brain can hold, like so many relationships that I can maintain uh, as a as a finite human being. And the world is always going to need uh, network nodes. It's it's always going to need people who are connectors and super connectors. And so, uh, yeah, the, the question is just like, do you do you 
find that tribe or do you make it? Now, do you feel like with the exit group is, is that number of 150, 175, is it kind of like a, a, do you have a cap in mind based on what you're saying there? Or is it scalable because you have other leaders and mentors in there? You have to find other leaders. Um, Mm -hmm. You have to find people who can hold the group in their mind. And, you know, obviously I have a database. I'm not, it's, there's, uh, there's technical solutions to make it easier, but fundamentally my ability to say, Oh, you have, um, this and that skill set, And I actually, like, I know a guy who I actually know to be skilled in, in, in the thing that you need, like that assessment. It's kind of like how, it's kind of like how, um, theoretically you could fix anything by watching YouTube videos. But most of us don't because we don't know which which video to watch and like does it really comp- is it really the same thing as my situation and like I don't yeah. want to break anything and so like you'll still go hire a mechanic even though you know in theory you could do it yourself yeah. um, and it's it's the same thing it's it's I don't know how to assess this guy's claim that he's a digital marketer so I need somebody who actually has talked to him and seen his deal and, and and knows his portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. So to answer your question directly about scaling, in-person connections are essential here. And right now at 160-ish, it's we're too spread out. We're not we're not close enough together to connect in real life in most places. There's probably three metros where we got that kind of clustering. And so my goal is to either 10 or 20 X this thing so that you, you can have a chapter in every major city where you've got 20, 25 guys that you can have barbecues and homeschool co-ops and, you know, get the kids playing soccer or whatever, uh, together yeah. in I real life on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, but that and will then- require facilitation that will require, um, a, a, a series of people who are in my seat making the connections. Yeah. And and it's bound together by a, a similar ethos, which is, you know, the exit group and maybe some, some kind of guidelines or something like that. I love that. What about, do you need to ask permission to do things, to make a move? <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it, you do not have to ask permission. You, you can, you can just do things. I I, I remember the it's first one of my time favorite ever, pieces of uh, words of wisdom from Bennett here. Yeah, I remember. I remember the first time I ever put a hammer through my uh, drywall, and I realized that like all there is is drywall and two by fours behind there. There's not. There's not a. It's not a fundamental law of the universe that these walls are where they are. You can you can knock them down, move them around, and and uh, I know guys who I know guys who work metal. And they had the same experience with like an automotive frame. They're like, oh yeah, I can just mess with that. I, that's not, uh, that's not dictated by God that it looks that way. Um, and, and, you know, your, your career is the same way. Uh, your network is the same way. You, you, you don't have to add, you don't have to wait for somebody to tell you it's okay. Like you can go take action. And, uh, and that, I mean, that ultimately that kind of initiative is, really hard to teach, but for, for the people with whom that resonates, I mean, that's exactly the type of guy that I'm looking for. Yeah. Is, is yeah. The, I've been like that as long as I can remember, there's probably a better way to put it because that in some ways that sounds like you're trying to break rules or something like that, but it's not that, like you said, a better word is initiative, you know, like yeah. take, take an initiative and try and do things and go for it. And because if you ask permission, you're always going to find people that say no or don't want you to, you know? Yeah. Like, and, and the majority the of the time, the time, people don't say anything if you just do something, you know? Like, I'm I the, the person came to mind right guys. now is like wearing, wearing masks, you know? I was just like, you know, what? Well, why Why are we doing it just because? Let's just try not doing it. See what I know? That's not a really, really good example. I, I'm, you know, probably applies more to business and personal decisions, but. But I no, I I always made them make me. I, I always made them tell me to put it on. Like I'm gonna make it a pain in the ass. Like you, you know, if, if if it's like you're gonna get thrown out of the store. Okay, let's have that conversation. Let's. It's gonna be a little confrontation. We're gonna mm-hmm. have that conversation. 
Um, and, and I would say um, I constantly run into it with guys who need to start a podcast or need to, need to put themselves out there in, in public. The secret of starting a podcast is that nobody will listen to your first episode. And, and the, the beauty of that is it doesn't have to be good. Like, like you, you can, people think the stakes are higher than they are because they think people will care. Nobody will care yeah. until it gets yeah. good. Once it gets good, then people will start to listen. And that's like, so just do it. Like, yeah. you know, and, and don't like, don't like, oh, am I good enough? Is it, is it right enough? It's just go do it and yeah. you'll get good. Yeah. I mean, part of this, I feel like what plays into it is, you know, not asking for permission, just, just trying things and going for it and doing it and wait until something happens or someone tells you. Right. And then uh, I think something else that ties into that is it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to be, you're never going to be ready for whatever it is that you think it is you want to do, especially if it's something new to you, <laughs> you know, it's like start as soon as you can. Yeah. I mean, if I had to have this thing figured out uh, before I was going to pull the trigger, I'd still be, yeah, I'd still be waiting. Well, that's how you figure it out as you start. Like I, I remember when I first started my business and I'm, I'm still building my business, you know, but when I first started is like, I would make appointments and I would make commitments to employers and to the clients and things. And I didn't have those things put together, but it forced me to put it together. You know? Right. So, so if someone, if whole food says, Hey, well, can you do a talk on inflammation in the immune system? You know, back in my early days. And I would not have, I mean, I would, wouldn't say, no, I'm, I don't have that put together yet. I think, yeah, absolutely. And then I put it together. I'll figure it yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. I'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a, there's a saying, no, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And I think that's true, but that's also like vital to the learning process. Like you, you have to go inflict your bad plan on the enemy and, and, uh, or the customer in this, in this case and have, and have that dialogue, have that conversation with the real world. Um, and let the real world refine your plan and change it yep. and break it. Yep. And that's how you get good at something is just continually right. making mistakes and trying things. And over time you develop some kind of wisdom around whatever it is that you're tinkering with, you know, the, that's the good stuff, person, man. The type of person that has the hardest time with that is the person who has this beautiful, elegant, crystalline, uh, vision in their mind because they're afraid to let they're afraid to let reality touch it yeah and uh and it's like you know what what i have to tell some of those guys is like your idea is not that good and it has to be broken it's good enough it's good enough to put out there but it's not so perfect that you need to cuddle it and protect it it's good enough to start like, yeah it's good enough to start go start it and and then be flexible enough to take the info that you receive as you go forward to adjust and make it better, yeah. you know, or exactly. quit it if you need to, I guess. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, Wait, we that... had a guy. We had a guy um, in in one of my other groups actually, who um, got his heart broken because uh, the the group the group listened to his idea and gave him feedback that it wasn't. A workable idea and uh and they were right i mean it wasn't a workable idea and and he, you could tell that in his mind that was his one idea he had been like that that idea had been like keeping him warm for years in his day job he's like i i have this genius in me this 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 vision this idea that i that i could do and and uh it's sort of like um guys who get really really obsessed about one girl that they like haven't really talked to <laughs> and then and then they're absolutely crushed when she says no to a date or whatever because they've built and they're like they're they're married in their mind they've built their whole relationship um and so and so it's devastating when they say no but the guy the guy who is asking lots of girls on dates that experience of rejection is so much easier to deal with and it's the same thing with business business is a lot like dating you 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 have lots of, you know, what we told him when he, when he kind of came back with like his, his feelings kind of hurt was like, 
you'll, you'll think of three more. You'll think of 10 more. Like ideas are cheap. Ideas are easy. Everybody's got ideas. And, uh, and, and entrepreneurship is in part the process of having lots and lots and lots of bad ideas until you get a good one. Yeah. You have to fail over and over and over to move forward, you know, like, and we hear it from uh, so many different people in walks of life, athletes, you know, entrepreneurs, people that are super successful. I mean, every one of them will tell you that they had that kind of a, a journey. Yeah. It's lottery tickets. What do you mean? So there's a, there's a, a video of a, of a <laughs> seminar about like how to, how to, how to choose the winning lottery numbers. And he talks about like, yeah, these, these guys get together and they, and they plot like, is it, is it even numbers are better? Odd numbers are better. Like what orders and like they're doing math, they're doing like complex calculus to figure out the right lottery numbers. And he's like, that's stupid. Um, lottery numbers are random. The way to win at the lottery is have lots and lots and lots of lottery tickets. And you can't, you can't, focus all your time on like choosing the correct lottery ticket. What you should focus your time on is printing them. How many lottery tickets can you get out there? Um, because that's how you win. Put it out there as many times as you can in any, every way that you can. And you're not saying like, you're looking for a lottery ticket. You're just saying like, Hey, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta put it out there as much as you can. Yeah. Ideas. Yeah. Ideas. Yeah. I love it, man. Um, this was awesome. We got to do a part two because there's some stuff we talked about in our other conversation that we didn't get to, but um, such good learning yeah, no points. Problem. I love it. Huh? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, let's do another one. But um, so if people want to connect with you, with a, where can we send them? Yeah, so uh, exit underscore org on Twitter. They can get me at kevin at exitgroup.us or they can go, or they can just go to exitgroup.us, sign up for the newsletter. Uh, check us out. That's that's the best way to get in touch. Cool. How often do you put out newsletters? Is it like a public info on a regular basis? I'm really trying to. I'm really trying to do once a week. Um, it's tough, but uh, yeah, fairly regular. And the podcast is is about once a week too. Cool. I can't believe I'm not subscribed to it. I listened to a few episodes. I don't Sorry. ever see one pop up. Yeah, I will, dude. Seriously, like such good learning points. It's great to know you, and um, look forward to another conversation in the future. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thanks, man. All right. I'll talk to you soon.